Hi, I'm JJ Walsh. This is Seeking Sustainability Live bonus video. Uh, when I had a visit to Kyoto last year, I followed up with one of the guests in the series, Robert Yellen, who's a pottery and ceramic expert who has a beautiful studio right down the hill from King Kakuji, the wooden temple in Kyoto that I'm showing right now. Robert was really nice and generous with his time and gave me a great tour of his gallery. And of course, the pieces uh, on display in this video are probably not available anymore, but it gives you an idea of the nice variety and introductions that you might have if you visit his studio one day. I'm sure. intrigued by this. We were talking about quality of clay, right? For this some pieces, you know, all right. really thick. Yeah. Um, this is uh, a piece by the current living national treasure, her Bizen. His name is Isazaki Jun. He's in his 80s. I've known him for a long time. Uh, he was influenced by the uh, many artists, but particularly Noguchi Isamu, the Japanese-American sculptor who went to Bizen in the 50s and you know started to expand uh, the form possibilities. Because uh, up to that time, it was very traditional forms used in the tea ceremony or for flowers, somewhat tableware, but now it's more uh, able to get. And he uh, creates these very monolithic forms um, using traditional clay. It's almost like this path down here. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the way that the shadow leads you into it. And uh, this drop. This would be considered the front of the piece because there's more uh, tonality and color changes. It's a pretty heavy piece. Okay. And then... This is the back. It's got a little quieter form to it. There was straw put here, mm -hmm. and just a little shadow effect. And this is called itogoma. It's like a thread with the straw burned off to this white tone. So the piece has a back and a front, just like a tea bowl. Mm -hmm. But it's got this warm tonality of the clay. And you know, I recommend to clients, when they get a piece like this, uh, you get like a little water mister. And you just kind of mist it over, you know, when you feel like it padded in there, the richness of the clay will, will pop out and it will change over time. Which is really cool. I, I love that about wooden buildings too. Yeah, How the wood in your natural, house yeah, will patina, change over time. Yeah, patina changes. That seems really heavy. It's pretty heavy. That's <laughs> like why, that's why 10, I mean, 15 kilos? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah around there. I, love, we'll, I mean, we'll send it around. It's somewhere. a bit magic, right? It's, How it's, it's definitely magic. during the kiln process. And there's no way to predict. Amazing. It. There's no way to predict what how it will come out. I love that. And I love this little shadow, this little orange yeah. here. It's like this little path you go into. So, um, and his son is also getting well known right now. Anybody who watches this and happens to be in Okayama, there's an unprecedented exhibition called The Bizen at the Okayama Prefectural Museum now. It's traveled around Japan since last year, February, where it started in Tokyo. And I wrote a column in the Japan Times about it. So if you go to the Japan Times website and you type in Bizen, um, you know, I think one of his pieces just like this is in there. But his son is also working in clay. And he made this piece. Oh, wow. So the lineage, you know, is very important, father and son. Um, or, or, or master to apprentice, uh, and that's how Japanese traditions uh, um, survive, because um, these techniques and skills uh, don't change much over time. It's how you interpret them uh, in, in your own uh, repertoire. And so the son um, went to New York and studied with an American potter for a while and came back very free. And he's making a vase form, a cylindrical form, but the way he paddled it and toned and, and uh, shaped it, it's very organic. And this was fired down like this. That's why these drips of ash are flowing that way. So when you look at a piece, you can sometimes tell how it was positioned in the kiln. And no ash hit here, which means it was in the kiln like this. All the ash uh, 
uh, fired over 10 days or so, hit here, liquefied, and then started to drip. And then when you put it upright, that's why you get that kind of flow to it. It's magical. That is magical. Yes. And I, I remember talking to potters in Bizen, and they were talking about the kiln process and how exciting it was to yeah. open the kiln and see what happened. Yeah, every time is new. You don't know. It's like, you know, equated to giving birth, and, and the, the kiln is a womb, you know, and it's like like jewels because it's, you know, a diamond, an emerald is born in the inferno of the earth, and these are, you know, clay jewels basically fired in a man-made or lady-made enclosed kiln, and you never know. You can't predict it. You know, porcelain like this, you can basically make a, a thousand pieces just like that. But bizen, you can never make, you know, and you mix and match um, with other styles as well. Beautiful. I love all the pieces. But I think for me, the somebody in the series the other day said, um, everything about a Japanese house is that it goes back to nature. So if it's not lived in, it'll just go back to dust over time. Yeah. Yeah. And similar idea for pottery, right? A, tra Bizen. a traditional house in Japan, made of traditional materials. Now we have, you know, this and that home and this and that home. It's all prefabricated uh, industrial materials. But um, yeah, and that's one of the beauties of, of, of clay. I mean, it is dust to dust, ashes to ashes, and, and we all go back to that. We all return to earth. Which was a great David Sylvie album, by the way. Um, but yeah, there's lots of mystery and, and theology and, and philosophy and spirituality in ceramic art when it's thought of in that way, um, because it is the materials of life itself. If you take away water, or you take away fire, or if you take away earth, clay, or if you, you, you take away water and air. Any one of those, which are all embedded in this is what we're looking at, we wouldn't have life. So there's a, there's a very powerful primitive energy to it that's attracted me. And that hasn't changed since Jomo, you know, when the first pots were made 12, 13,000 years ago. They're using the same materials. That's just like mind boggling, you know? Do you get that sense from the potters that you talk to that oh, they, they feel that impermanence of what they're making? A lot of them do. You know, it's rooted in the past, I mean, connected to the past, rooted in the present, and it'll kind of flow into the future. Um, yeah, and, and they know, many of them, you know, they're part of this very, very deep ancient tradition, and how do they interpret it? You know, it's a, not an easy thing to do. Mm. Beautiful. This is really striking. So this is a sixth generation Seto artist. His name is Yamaguchi Makoto. He's very popular now. Um, and he took these ancient glaze recipes, morphed them into his own, ripped and tore. There's, there's one over here as well. Uh, very popular um, in Japan. Makes a lot of different styles. And just wow. engaging, rich, beautiful glazes. Look at that. Called Oribe. And that's natural glaze? He's using natural recipes, you said? Yeah, um, well, natural, you know, he gets different uh, chem uh, mixes, you know, glazes that he concocts himself from different minerals and pigments and ash. Mm. You know, and then it's meant to be used. You know, you put some sake in here and, you know, forget about TV. That's gorgeous. That's a good size sake cup. You only fill it like a third and then you enjoy the ma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You enjoy the, the emptiness. Yeah. Oh, nice. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't want to fill it up. I mean, in the West, it's like, oh, you've got to fill it up. No, no, no. You leave most of it empty. And you enjoy how the, inter the, the sake interacts with that. I love that High idea. Highlighting the colors of the walls. And hey, sometimes you want to fill it up. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But it's, that goes along with the idea of, of emptiness being beautiful, oh, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the, the, the core of the Heart Sutra. You know, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. You 
know, that jar there, that little green jar, if there was no emptiness inside, you wouldn't have form. Um, so sometimes things you can't see which are the most important. You know, you know in, the, in the West, we don't think about that. You know, but that emptiness inside is what is able to create the form that we see. And uh, I think our own bodies as a vessel sometimes are the same thing. You're a little kid, your head is empty. What are you going to fill it with? Most of the times you have no choice. You're just indoctrinated into that. How do you liberate yourself? So um, I think about that a lot. Speaking of liberating yourself, this is not a very classic style, um, but I love it. So I woke up at uh, 6.30 this morning to take part in a Zoom session from New York. And I was put this down. That artist who we're looking at, that big black piece, um, in my opinion, his name is Akiyama Yo, uh, originally from Yamaguchi, but he's lived in Kyoto a long time. Uh, he is one of the most important artists in the world. And he participated in a Zoom session this morning uh, via the wonderful gallery in New York called Joan B. Mervis Limited. And he and his wife are now having a two-person show. Actually, ties in with the theme we were just talking about. It's called Seen Unseen. And you can um, access that at Joan's site, Mervis.com. And she hosted a beautiful uh, Zoom session this morning, talking with Akiyama Sensei and his wife and a couple of other artists. Um, this is very Kyoto, uh, uh, which was born out of a post-World War II movement called Sodesha, where everything was purely sculptural. And he's taken that to an you know, incredible uh, level of artistry. It's a very powerful piece, incredible artist. I can't get his work that often. Uh, just go online, Akiyama Yo, uh, Y-O, uh, and uh, educate yourself about him, because I can't say enough. He's, he's just, just monumental power and grace and, and depth. And he's a very humble man, very quiet. Um, I just, I'm in awe of him. You learn how to use a wheel. Anybody can use a wheel. You know, that's just taking time. It's like driving a car. You just learn to use it. But if you want to be a true artist other than a craftsman, how do you stretch that? How do you go beyond um, the, 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 the boundaries that are placed? within a bowl. That's why tea bowls are so interesting, because it's a small form, it's a very limited form. Now, how do you put your own individual personality into it? You know, anybody can make a bowl, but how do you put it, let, it's like, as Lao Tzu said in the 6th century BC, so that every piece is as much the artist's signature or heartbeat. And he also wrote in this poem, and the higher developed a potter is as a human being, the better his or her pot, because there's no real beauty without character. So you're really looking at a mirror of these artists' soul. That's why tea bowls can be so expensive. The higher the person is developed, of course, you know, in Japan, the hierarchy of just going up the ladder of artistic merit and getting awards. Sometimes the tea bowls are astronomically priced and not deservingly so. It's only that they've, you know, served on this committee or won that award. Uh, and th th that can be just a facade. But when you get into a real deep tea bowl, you're, 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 you're touching the pulse of somebody. And uh, Lao Tzu got that, you know. It's a great poem. A great, great poem. I remember from our talk, one of the things that I always referred back to is when you said one of the potters, uh, his clients complained his cups were too expensive. Oh, the, and yeah, you, you, they you, said, it only took you five minutes. And 60 years. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how the Shoji. Um, I have one of his sake cups over here. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? So don't underestimate the value of experience. There you have it. So this is interesting. This is from other Shoji. This is a five minute, 60 year guy. This is his son, who's now about 85. This man passed away at 78. 
And this is his grandson. Oh, wow. So Hamada Shoji, who was born in the 1800s, first living treasure for Mashko. He didn't make many sake cups because he didn't drink, unfortunately. And then his son, who was born in the 20s, made this. And then his grandson, who's now the head of the kiln, made that. Three generations. Tochigi. So they're all in Tochigi, mm -hmm. the same family. Correct. And family they're kiln. using the same kiln. Um, he and the father are using the same kiln. The kiln that this man built, a lot of it was destroyed in the big earthquake. They rebuilt it. Um, I think they fired it once as a community project. Made that painting. It's nice to have a, a bit of difference. You also have a beautiful painting over here. So that is an artist um, whose name is Nishimura Daiki. Um, I found him at a local Zen temple, just by chance or fate, whatever. Um, and he was only in his 20s at the time. And I, when I looked at the painting, I thought, this is so deep. There's so much spirit here. It must be somebody in their 70s or 80s, you know, somebody with years of experience. And this young kid basically goes, well, no, that's mine. He uh, graduated from the Osaka Fine Arts University with an MFA, won all of his graduation prizes. And I just thought, um, a jar in front of that, just one three-dimensional piece, would create a dialogue with him and, and the work. So I've been a, a big fan of his. You know, it, 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 we're very cluttered here in my gallery, but just imagine one piece in front of that in the alcove. It's this wonderful dialogue. And you know, it's so deep, it, it's, 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 it's a, you know, the universe or, mm -hmm. or walking into some mystical forest or you know a cave I mean there's so much depth to his paintings and he's very philosophical incredibly um, deep thinking young man and most of the titles he gets are from ancient uh, lines and books so um, yeah I'm a big fan of his Nishimura Daiki that's awesome so um, in the past or even today, uh, the, a real sake collector connoisseur would say, Bizen tokuri karatsu hai. So this is like the ultimate combination of a glazed piece and an unglazed piece. Uh, one, this is from Saga Prefecture, the port town of Karatsu. Uh, this is a, something called a Madara Karatsu. It's an ash glazed piece and a beautiful Bizen flask by the great Mori Togaku. So you never, most of the time, want to have the same style. You want to mix and match according to your mood, according to the sake, according to the seasons, according to the food, um, to mix and match your vessels and kind of create it uh, out of your own personality. So this is a boat flask from the Momoyama period. So this is a 400 year old sake flask for a boat. So it's stout and sturdy, it won't be rolling about this or that. But it's still powerful and still has presence and, and energy. Uh, this is an early Edo period black karatsu piece, kind of leaning over. So this is about 350, 80 years old but still beautiful. Um, it's used in a tea ceremony, but now uh, you could still use a tea ceremony, but you, this is not really a, a one person size unless you really drink a lot of sake. So people use it as a bud was. And on the tray is an interesting form. It's a stemmed cup called a bajohai. So if you were riding a horse, it would be easy to grasp. And, you know, if you had a cup like this shape, you'd just fly out of your hand. So this is called a bajo, and ba is a horse, and jo is on top of. And this piece was made by the first living national treasure of Bizen, born in the late 1800s, passed away in 1967. His name is Kanishige Toyo. And he was the first living treasure, and we just mentioned the fifth living treasure. So um, 
They also in loved to make wonderful sake cups. And different, you know, pouring vessels, this or that. Some are porcelain. I don't have a lot of porcelain, but this is one of my favorite styles, which is out in Ishikawa Prefecture called Kotani. And it's another, as you can see, stemmed piece by uh, Mr. Asakura. Yeah, it's just so fun. It's like, you know, finding fun shells and pieces of nature on the shore. And sake vessels can be expensive. Um, they're referred to as uh, items that you use in the tea ceremony for um, uh, the kaiseki meal. Whereas a larger teacup is called a zaki, which is common crockery, which is more you use at your kitchen table. So even though a sake cup is much smaller than a teacup, the teacups are usually less expensive because of the way they're classified in the hierarchy of Japanese ceramics. Zaki, chadogu, in a way. So people can get pretty mystified. You're like, this little cup, it's like $4,000. But you know, you can find really nice pieces for $40 or $30. It's not the price that dictates the quality. It's something that you appeals to you. That's the most important thing. And you can afford it. So that's where you start. Now, I started with a 700 yen cup at the local supermarket. Do you still have it today? No, I don't. I, I, uh, but I do have one of the early cups from Bizen that I bought. And it was like 3,500 yen, which was a lot for me back then. Um, I, I have it. Um, it doesn't interest me that much anymore, but it's, it's, it shows my roots, you know, where I began. Uh, Hakone. Hakone. So up, you know, um, in Kanagawa, there's the famous hot spring area called uh, Hakone. And they've got a few museums, and one's the um, outside air museum. And there's lots of sculptures, big sculptures out and about. And I had, you know, I can't bring everything in because of a limited space. I thought, well, you know, a couple of these jars we'll just put out. And they have to be stoneware jars. They can't be delicate porcelains or, I mean, that wouldn't really work. You want something really energetic and, and you, know, um, uh, you know, full of uh, energy of, of, of the planet. So these natural stoneware jars fit better outside than glazed pieces. And the weather will only give them patina, you know, mm -hmm. so that's nice. That's yeah, that, really that Mobi, interesting. Mobius strip, Mobius strip. That's mm -hmm. by an artist in Seto. You know, I'm trying to figure out where the best places are too. So we're always having fun. His name is Takeuchi Shingo, and uh, he's in his 60s. Pretty world renowned, and instantly recognizable. It's kind of like this twist between Escher, M. C. Escher, and Miyake Issei. You know, this like movement and some braiding, very evocative. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just perched on the rock out there. And then we have the, uh, the skinny moon viewing shishi uh, animal out there with a bolt on in its mouth. The Japan Ceramic Society Mishima branch. That's an Edo period tokoname jar. Mm. And it was one of the first subo that I ever acquired by Mr. Kikokawa. He's in heaven now. So it's, uh, it's got a lot of nostalgia and significant meaning to me. I was the only foreigner, you know, in this uh, branch. It's called the Nihon Toji Kyokai, the Japan Ceramic Society. They have branches all over Japan. And uh, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and most of the members were always, they were just into antiques. So uh, I was more into living artists. So we would go to like Bizen or, or the Mino area or um, uh, Hagi, and there'd be like 15 elderly Japanese people behind me, and I would have this flag and uh, leading them about. Thanks for joining me on this tour of Robert's beautiful gallery with me. You can see more about Robert's gallery, the pieces he has in his collection now, on his website, which I'll link below, or his Instagram page where he features not only the latest pottery he has in his gallery, but also his latest articles and information about the potters that he meets and features. Robert's passion for pottery and the philosophy behind the pieces 
is so infectious and so interesting and such an important part of Japanese heritage and culture. I love the variety of styles that he has in his studio and his philosophy that there is no bad choice of pottery for you. You should choose something that you like and use it in good health.